couple of years ago, I went on a journey, a real expedition, to one of the most remote locations on the planet, the northern corner of Ethiopia. It took us three days to get there from the capital city of Addis Ababa. We first flew to a tiny outpost town called Mekele, and we landed on a dirt runway, my first dirt runway. And from there, we jumped into land cruisers and drove off across the high plateau until we reached a great chasm, the great Afar Rift Valley. We plunged down the 7,000 feet to the valley floor, and along the way, we passed vast trains of camels laden with salt that they had obtained from salt mines in the northern half of the valley. And our guides informed us that men and beasts carried the salt up and out of the valley over to the village, dropped it off, and went back down and mined more salt, day in and day out, for most of their lives. We camped somewhere near this place that night in a small makeshift camp with tiny huts and rope-strung cots that we all piled onto together, and we slept under the night breeze, hot in the desert sky, my favorite way to camp. And the next day, we drove out across the dusty, bumpy dirt road, across the valley floor, past fields of sand dunes and wide wadis that contained tiny trickles of water, around which were gathered animals and people trying to get whatever water they could out of this dry desert. After all day driving, we finally arrived at the base of our destination, the giant shield volcano Urta Ale. We paused here at the Afar village to parley with the chief and the village leaders for permission for guides to help access the summit of the mountain. After many hours, and by the cover of night, which was slightly under 100 degrees in temperature, we finally marched up the hill. And we were a group of tourists and scientists and young Ethiopian tour guides from the city and Afar escorts and camels, and we paraded up the hill. And it was very dark, and it was hot and windy. For much of the journey, I had at my side a kind Afar guide. And I noticed at one point that he had an AK-47 on his shoulder and a belt of hand grenades. And I thought to myself, I just hope I don't trip and grab onto one of those hand grenades. But we made it up the mountain, and arrived at the summit, and I could see off in the distance a faint red glow. And I said, can we go? And they said, yes. So down the steep cliffs of the caldera, the depression in the summit, we scrambled by headlight and out across the floor of the caldera, across lava flows, some of which were so shiny in my headlamp that I knew they were just weeks old until finally we crested the summit of yet another small crater and saw this beautiful volcanic image, a lake of lava. You can hear the wind blowing, sending waves of gas and heat. The smell is rotten eggs. It's my favorite smell because then I know I'm on a volcano or by a hot spring. and I finally found myself standing in front of another lake of lava in the southwest Pacific called Vanuatu, absolutely incandescent, and soon you can hear the sound of the actual lake itself. You can hear the words of our mountaineer Pepe, that it is just hard to describe what it's like to be standing in front of the creation of new land. Well, why would we go to all this trouble to take such a journey at great expense in time and resources and at some amount of risk? Well, first of all, we just love the adventure. I mean, when you hear this story, don't you think, I've got to experience that for myself. But we could ask the question, why? Do we think that of some place that's so difficult to access? We explore so that we may discover. 
We understand as scientists that we can learn more about our natural world simply by exploring it. And so we endure and maybe even enjoy the hardship that comes along with such an endeavor. Well, why lava lakes in particular? This Cassini image shows our big brother, Jupiter, with its beautiful bands of clouds encircling the equator with Earth-sized storms, and hovering above the cloud tops like a jewel is the tiny moon Io. It's the same size as Earth's moon, but there are a lot of differences. Here you can see from even this distance that the surface is covered in beautiful colors. And it's these colors and the proximity to Jupiter that should tell us what we will see when we look at the surface of Io in great detail. And that is hundreds of active volcanoes. These are lava flows. These are brightly colored sulfur deposits in yellows and reds and greens all of which have come from the inside of Io because of the relentless tug of Jupiter's gravity. Many of these are expressed as lakes of lava for reasons we don't quite understand, but you can see perhaps a dozen lakes of lava in this picture and in a few other pictures similar to this one and one or two others that are at slightly better resolution. But that's about all we have for Io. So we go and visit lava lakes on the Earth, because we can stand next to them, we can find out how hot they are, we can see what happens to them over time, and then take that understanding and apply it to Io. Similarly, we can look at lakes of lava on Io, some of which are so large they're the size of the Great Salt Lake. And we can think about a time when the inside of Earth was so hot that there were lakes of lava that big on Earth. There no longer are today, so Io is telling us about our history. Well, this is how we are learning about the solar system. We have a strategy that pairs pure scientific exploration with scientific discovery. Planetary scientist Torrance Johnson says that when we keep exploration at the forefront of all we are doing in space, then we are captivated motivated and committed. This year, we are exploring two bodies for the first time. The one on the left is Ceres, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. The Dawn mission has just arrived at Ceres, and it's coming closer and closer in its orbit over the next year. The one on the right is Pluto. The New Horizons spacecraft will fly past Pluto in July, and we'll see it in incredible detail. So this is the worst picture of Pluto you'll ever see again. <laughs> the European Space Agency visited a tiny comet this year with an orbiter and a plucky little lander that bounced around on the surface and sent back all the data it could before it went to sleep in the growing darkness. All three of these bodies are very small. They're heavily cratered, which means they have old surfaces. But we're so riveted by all of the news about these bodies. We're so excited to hear what's next for them. And this is because we have never seen them before. When we prioritize exploration, then we are inspired, and new and valuable discoveries can occur. This picture of Saturn is inherently so beautiful. But it becomes even more incredible when we think about how it had to be obtained. We had to have been sitting on the other side of Saturn and looking back toward the Earth and the Sun so that we could see the sunlight shining through the atmosphere and the rings illuminating them. So we could not take this picture from the Earth. And now we feel like we're on a voyage with the Cassini spacecraft around the backside of Saturn, looking back toward the Earth and seeing it with our own eyes. A really good reason to explore the Saturn system is to learn more about the largest moon, Titan. It's a little bit bigger than the planet Mercury. And in this picture, you can see the sunlight shining off of a surface of liquid methane, a giant sea called Kraken. At Titan's distance from the sun, 10 times as far away from the sun as the Earth, methane is so cold that it's a liquid and not a gas. And it forms clouds, and it rains onto the surface and fills up seas. 
The sunlight is diffuse in this picture because the atmosphere is very thick with a haze made out of organic materials like benzene and propane and methane with a pressure at the surface just like Earth's. There's no other body in the solar system that can claim that. So now we have rainfall, rivers, lakes, seas, organics, and an Earth-like atmosphere. And suddenly, Titan is a very compelling place for us to study. There are also vast fields of sand dunes. They appear dark in this radar picture because sand is very fine and the dunes are smooth to radar, similar to how dunes on the Earth would look to radar. And there are other similarities with the mega sand dunes of Earth. They're about a half a mile wide, they're hundreds of miles long, and they collect together into vast seas of sand. Sand seas, where would we get this terminology? Well, we've been applying it to Earth's big deserts ever since scientist, explorer, colonel Ralph Bagnold visited Egypt and Libya back during World War II. He conducted espionage by driving through the deserts in his Model A Fords up and over the sand dunes like waves on an ocean. And he brought back valuable information about sand dunes that we still reference in the scientific dune literature to this day. He went out in the desert because he had to, but he returned with knowledge. So we follow in the footsteps of Ralph Bagnold, and we go out into the deserts, like this one in Namibia, in Southwest Africa, and we bring with us instruments to measure where the dune is moving, what it's like in the inside, what it's made of, and what will happen to it in the future. And we apply that understanding to sand dunes on Titan, for which we only have a handful of low-resolution images. And once again, we can also look at the vast sand seas of Titan that encircle the globe, unlimited by vegetation or by global oceans, and we think about how we can apply that understanding to the dunes of Earth, much more confined and subject to rapidly changing winds and climate. Well, ultimately, we have to remember that exploration is a human endeavor. And so we go out to explore with our colleagues, with our students, and with our own ideas and goals for what we might discover. Those goals change over time because new people go and our understanding changes over time. But we hope that every time we go out into the field, we bring with us an open-mindedness so that we can be ready to discover whatever thing there is for us to see. And we meet people along the way, and they are beautiful. And they almost seem otherworldly because they get to live in such an incredible place. They get to live next to a lake of lava. <laughs> well, they appreciate their the place where they live for other reasons. Like the tourists in central China who go out into the desert to see tall pillars and hoodoos that look to them like ships or like sphinxes, and they appreciate the stark beauty of the desert landscape. When we go as scientists, we see a different kind of beauty. We see wind-carved ridges that are rare and ephemeral. And we feel lucky to see them because we know that they disappear quickly. And we wonder if they are analogs for similar kinds of features we might see on Venus or Mars or Titan. And we imagine a time when we might actually be able to go out there and see those things from the field. The final image here is so compelling because it speaks to us of possibility. It tells us what can be. But we have to remember that we are already doing this, right here on our own unique and special planet Earth that holds many more secrets waiting for our discovery. Thank you.